Hey folks, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day. Hey, I'm in uh, seeing a few questions come across the comment sections on the uh, videos that I've done for the MSI Afterburner uh, app. And uh, well, I thought I'd answer a few of them here. Maybe just trying to give you some some insight and some in, maybe a little instruction here. Um, for those who don't know, MSI Afterburner is generally thought of as a as a uh, video card tweaking tool, primarily used by gamers and such, to you know, like you see on the interface here in the center of the screen, um, you know, to tweak your video card settings, you know, driver and hardware allowing, of course, but you know, things like your fans and you know the the RAM and the, or the GPU or the D, the the uh, GPU RAM and the and the GPU clock speed stuff like that, but. Something on, on else that uh, Afterburner is known for is its capabilities with uh, doing uh, video capture. And it's free, and you don't have to have an MSI card or any kind of MSI hardware to use it. It just works on hardware. Uh, the back end of it really is the old Riva tuner. Um, in fact, that's what handles a lot of the uh, video capture functions and a lot of that stuff and a lot of the interfaces with uh, your video drivers. Um, but in any case, um, you know, uh, tuning your video cards is one thing, but doing video capture is another. And there's a lot of features here that confuse some people. And it's a little more complex than even like the paid version of Fraps, which is another video capture uh, application. But what we're going to do today is just kind of take a look at some of the features. Now, kind of explain some differences and some things you should know. Um, just trying to avoid some of the gotchas. So with that, let's go ahead and launch into this. Okay, first thing you need to know, by default, uh, Afterburner is really meant to be a 3D kind of capture app, which means 3D more, more, more like 3D gaming, which means um, it's looking for direct X hooks. So right out of the box, Afterburner is going to capture you know your video game footage and app, but it may not get your desktop. Now there's been videos that talk about you know I'll go into the settings and look here and look here. Okay, it's a lot simpler than that. Really, if you're trying to get your desktop video capture, and by the way, I'm capturing this video with Afterburner with this very app right here. That's why you see a little blinking going on. But really, if you just want, if you if you can't get it Afterburner to just you know, hit your capture key and start getting your desktop, you need to check here. You need to go to this information, this I button here. And once you're here, just kind of scroll down and look for something called Active 3D Process. Now, strangely enough, it seems like um, cloud file storage apps trigger this for some reason. Uh, Dropbox, uh, Microsoft OneDrive, you know, Cloud Drive, all those kind of apps get picked up by afterburners being 3D processes and if it if you're on the desktop trying to do desktop video capture and afterburner detects that this particular app is kind of app is running it's not going to do anything it's not going to capture video so shut them down like I have and I also have a video that kind of shows that even in more detail you can go look for it but just know that start there if you're trying to do desktop video capture that said, uh, we can actually move an interface and to actually change things around and actually change settings, not just for video capture, but for all Afterburner, we're going to go ahead and click on a little gear icon here. Now, I'll note that this is uh, Afterburner 4.1.0, as you can see here, and that's how you tell what version you are. It's always down here in the little corner here. I'm pointing to it. I don't know if Ms. Kirsch is going to show up, but in the... Uh, just above the graph that's showing the by default temperature, but for your video card, that is, uh, if you look just here, uh, just to the lower left of the startup area, you'll see the version number for your afterburner. That's how you know what version. This is 4.1.0. So we click the gear anyway. We get into the settings, and here you got the settings for the whole app. You know, how, from everything from how it looks to what you monitor and how the monitor looks and colors. You know, on-screen displays, what do they look like, what's the toggles, that's all fine, but we're not really worried about stuff about, about 
tweaking our card or how it looks. We're talking about video capture. This is the thing most people are interested in. Now, the first thing you need to know is, and the first question I seem to get is, where do I set my video capture key? What is it? And by default, it's usually not defined. Well, the first place you look is the first box under the video capture tab, video capture here. If you click in this box and you hit a key, that's the key that gets assigned. It's pretty much simple as that. So if you wanted to find the key, like I use numlock minus key because it's a key that rarely gets used for anything else. And that's what I would suggest, a key you don't use for anything else. I wouldn't even suggest a function key because you never know what a function key is going to do. Um, just I just use a, I use the numlock keys. Um, so that's that. Next swing down, video pre-record. You say, well, what's that? Well, the video pre-record is actually a way, say you're, you're playing a game or you're, you're doing something on the desktop and you want to make sure you don't miss anything that maybe you did but didn't get, you didn't have the record going at the time. What this does is if I enabled it, um, I, could, I could set a limit with uh, how many seconds or how many minutes I wanted to have have MSI Afterburner ready to grab that content before I hit the video capture key, or in this case, or in my case rather, that before I hit that numlock minus key. And you can see here that I can actually set I can set these uh, values here. And oh, by the way, I've got the tooltips up, which also tell you how a lot of these things work. I've had it set to manual, uh, but you can set it to automatic, which means it's always running. Uh, which, depending on what you're capturing to, may not be the best thing, or, or the speed of the device. Um, but you can see here, you have you have a buffer limit, pre-record buffer limit, and this is in seconds. Or you have the choice of size, uh, file size. It could be file size or RAM size, because uh, you can actually choose to pre-record to RAM instead of on a disk. Although that could fill up RAM pretty quickly, depending on, you know, how much you, you've allocated. If you do it by, like in this case, the pre-record buffer minute sets for 600 seconds. Well, that's basically 60 seconds, you know, times how, what, however for minutes. Um, let's say 300 seconds would be five minutes. So this is like 10 minutes right here. This is 10 minutes of pre-record time, which is quite a lot. Um, or if I wanted to, I could set it for 256 megabytes of pre-record time. It doesn't matter. It, it gives you that flexibility to have that pre-record. I tend not to use it because I've had trouble with this pre-record. Sometimes, for example, it makes these files that are called pre-record or dot pre-record, which should be files that are in the format or, the, or using the codec of whatever you'd normally use to record a file if you hit the record key. But Sometimes they don't work, sometimes they don't attach, sometimes they get a little screwed up. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the pre-record thing, so I usually leave it turned off. But, you know, if you want to try it, if you've got a real fast drive in there that you record to, and you've, or you've got copious amounts of RAM you're not using, and you want to do it in RAM, which is obviously faster, um, you can go ahead and try that. I generally don't, but it's there. Uh, a note about recording devices, too, while we're... While we're discussing pre-record and RAM and, and disk usage. I strongly suggest that anything you anytime you're doing recording a video that you record to an external source. If, uh, because of course you're going to have contention for rights um, if you're trying to record video and run your operating system or your app at the same time and you could get drop frames or poor quality video or no video at all. It could just crash. So I would I recommend a good quality external uh, capture device, you know, a hard drive, an SSD. If it's a hard drive, make sure it's got ample cache. Make sure it's at least a 7200 RPM spindle speed. You know, if it's an SSD, well, that's kind of a given. You know, your worst SSD is going to be better than the best hard drive. But um, and I would make sure it's connected no less than USB 3 or I would say uh, eSATA or Thunderbolt, something like that, I would, I would definitely recommend. So that said, um, keep in mind, uh, 
you know what you need to, what you really should be set up to to get adequate video or you could get really disappointed when you do say you know three hours of video capture and you know your hard drives full or you didn't get anything or everything's garbled you know just so keep that in mind okay moving on to kind of the meat and potatoes of uh, video capture with afterburner um, you will move down a list here first this is video format and here you see we can choose uh, among, among a few different uh, formats here um, uncompressed and uh, NVT2 FT, RTV I generally leave it at MJPEG um, you know, there's other there's other formats you could plug right into here. That's something I haven't really done. Not something I've ever, I've really needed for my use. Um, generally, MJPEG works the best. I've had trouble with RTV and the other ones just because uh, a lot of video editing programs than that, especially the stuff that's free out there, doesn't know what to do with them, and you end up having to convert them. So I just usually stay with the MJPEG compression. But you have options here. You know, if you had an external one, you could configure an external one and bring it in here and use that if you wanted to. And you know, maybe you found a found a format that's that's more efficient or one that doesn't create such huge files. And that's something that is kind of kind of a down downside of MJPEG because it tends to make huge files. Um, for example, um, I'm doing this video in multiple files mostly because. Um, if I do five minutes of video, say, I'm ending up with 10 gigabyte videos. Well, that's mostly because I'm recording in HD resolutions. Um, but that's the thing. Um, also, that, that kind of leads to the next thing, our container format, which does have some effect on the file size. Here it's going to AVI because it's kind of a universal Windows file format that I use. Um, this MKV, again, I've had a lot of trouble with... Uh, video editors being able to do anything with an MKV. You know, your mileage may vary, but that's pretty much your choices here, AVI and MKV. So, you know, again, you can play around with it, but pretty much these are defaults and they seem to work fine. Um, I get good quality videos out. In fact, I get better videos out of this than I get out of Fraps. So if that tells you anything. All right, moving on to the quality settings. Now, this is something that, um, Quality kind of goes in hand in hand with, uh, with, with the other two settings, frame rate and frame size. The quality settings are more like the bit rate settings. I, did, I had a video where I was discussing um, the effect of bit rate on your video captures. You can have you know, the same resolution, all that, but for some reason, the vid, the vid, you know, if you capture at a 4,000 or a 4K bit rate as opposed to 10K bit rate, the video looks terrible at 4K and looks great at 10K. It's the amount of information that's getting captured. Um, if I do 100% quality, my videos are going to be bigger because they're grabbing every single pixel of activity going on. Um, if I drop it down to 25%, well, okay. Uh, it's, I'm going to have a much smaller file, but the video is going to look like trash and probably won't be watchable on anything but a PlayStation Portable. So, know that. But that ties in with the frame size. Here in, in Afterburner, we have a choice here. We have full frame, half, third, quarter. And then you have all these, all these you know, 16 by 9, 16 by 10, 720, 900. Okay, this is more a lot akin to not really resolution but video size and I'll show you here actually we're gonna get out of this and I'll show you a couple of videos here that I made now the first one here these are all the same desktop and the first thing you should notice and I probably want to well not I can't really do anything about that but um, the first thing you'll notice is that these videos that the size here uh, this one I did in quarter frame, that quarter frame setting, and if I open it up, okay, you'll see that the video plays, and you see it's small, it's a very small box. Also, if I try to drag it open to a larger screen, you see it looks a little bit fuzzy, just kind of fuzzy. And uh, hope, hopefully you're watching this, this video in 1080, so you can really see the difference. If you're watching at 360, you won't. Okay, now the next video, 
I actually did in half frame. Remember, the first one was quarter frame. This one's half frame. I'm going to go ahead and open that. And notice it's a bigger video. And it's a little clearer because I'm getting half of the frame information in here. So it's a size thing, but it's also kind of a quality thing. So then this is why I say that the, the video quality and the uh, capture size that are actually kind of interrelated. You also see that the file is a little bigger. You see this one was five, was about five, I don't know, five megabytes here, yeah. And this one was eight megabytes. This video now is full frame. I did a full frame capture and what you'll see when it loads up is that, wow, see how big this is? This is actually the full screen. This was 1920 by 1080. And you see how clear the video is. So keep that in mind. And that had, that, those videos were created by changing nothing but that frame capture set. And that was, remember, we'll go back here, right in here, this frame size. So these two are kind of interrelated as far as how good it looks and how big the video is. The frame size is going to have a direct effect on how big the video is. Frame rate, I generally keep it 30 frames per second for videos I'm going to watch on YouTube or anything because it, that, that's enough. Um, you know, watching an HD movie in a, on IMAX is 24 frames, so, you know, 30 is, is fine. If you want to do 60, that's fine, but you better make sure your hardware can support it or you'll get drop frames. Um, you can set a frame limit here all the way up to 100 frames per second. So you can kind of lock it down to try to try to kind of hold this in, in check if you want to. These two are kind of related. But really, I usually leave it at about 30 frames per second. Really, for most people, for watching videos online, you don't need any more than 30 FPS. And most people, it's going to tax their bandwidth to try to watch your video at anything more than 30. So... Um, Right now, I've got a frame limit to set because I'm not going to go above 30. But, and again, you've got the tool tips here. And you always have those. Those are enabled just to help you along. They're just more granular information. The final thing in this section here in this in video capture properties, the videos folder, you can set that to whatever you want. Um, this one happens to be local because I don't have an external. I'm not taking my own advice. But th this video has to be going to the default folder, which is always going to be C users, you know, whatever your user is, public and video capture. That's the default MSI afterburner. You can set it to whatever you want. Just browse and set it, and it'll work. So, so that's the video capture properties. Okay. Now that we've talked about the actual video capture, let's look at some of these other uh, kind of periphery but equally important settings. Uh, for one thing, if you have a, uh, uh, well, most people do, a, a processor that's got multiple cores or multiple threads, you know, hypertransport or whatever, um, you can set Afterburner to actually take advantage of this. Now, the default setting is automatic, but you can drop it down to take, to take, as, much, uh, take as much as eight threads. Now, um, this particular system, I should tell you right now, only has two cores. It's an old system and it doesn't have hyperthreading. So if I tried to set it for eight threads, uh, chances are it would start choking on itself pretty quickly. Um, so I just leave it automatic and let Afterburner take as many threads as it needs. Um, you can set it. I mean, if you've got, you know, a 5960X and, you know, you've got uh, 16 threads to play with, then by all means set it to eight. Um, but, you know, again, your mileage may vary as I. No, it's an overused term, but it's applicable. Anyway, some other stuff, crop video dimensions to 16. This is primarily compatibility with certain codecs and, again, with your editing because some, certain codecs, uh, they want to see that multiple. So I just, and that's usually checked by default. Uh, gamma correction. One thing Afterburner does do is when it does videos, especially game videos, they tend to look a little dark, um, even darker than what you say when you recorded them. So what this will do is brighten them up a bit. It will make sure it looks more more like what you thought you were capturing instead of something that looks like was taken in somebody's closet. Um, again, I've enabled the MJPEG controller. 
So again, it's more of a compatibility thing. It helps MSI. Um, but again, it's like I'm saying, Sarah, if you look at the tooltip, it's saying it, you know, Vegas Pro doesn't support it. Um, you know, I mean, again, your mileage may vary. If you're using, if you're using something like Sony Vegas Pro or that, I mean, the chances are you're probably not using Afterburner to grab videos anyway. But for in this case, I leave it on just just to help the processing CPU get a little more involved, that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, this one a dedicated encode server. Um, if you have got one running, great, uh, use it. If you but if you don't, then just leave it alone. Generally, these are these are the if you're doing a got a Windows desktop and you're capturing a desktop or you're capturing game video, these are the options that I personally enable for the videos that you've seen on my on my channels. So, which leads us to the last set of settings here, the audio. These are kind of funky. Here's the deal: um, just like Fraps, you can, can you can actually capture two audio sources, and by default, this is going to be set to you know auto select. Well, that's kind of a that's kind of a crapshoot. Um, generally, like right now, I'm using direct sound capture device, and I'm actually going off on HD uh, webcam uh, microphone. So, and I'm finding that's the best way to get my video. If I had a second audio source, I could just go ahead and I can enable either a, either a direct sound or a voice appy if the device supports that. And that's just another uh, basically another kind of uh, protocol or another system of, of accessing sound hardware um, but generally uh, I leave it I, I generally leave it alone when I'm doing videos like this for desktop just like fraps there's always a little bit of a coin toss when you're trying to capture two audio sources and here's one thing I found especially with doing game video captures is that point number one the thing that works the best is Audio source number one, if you're doing voiceovers while you're playing a game and getting you know video out of that, um, make sure that whatever you're using as a microphone is the first audio source. Because the second audio source two is not only the second source, but it's kind of a secondary source. And what will happen is um, it tends to favor the first audio source over the second audio source. And what will happen is you is you may get great game video, but your voiceover or your instruction or whatever you were saying through the microphone gets muffled or muted, and you end up with an undesirable result. Now, one way to kind of get by that, um, you have these two two uh, buttons here. Now, if you're recording in 5.1 or 7.1, you probably want to down mix uh, to stereo, especially because most people aren't going to be listening to YouTube videos in 5.1. Um, so I basically I, I down mix it to stereo to a stereo rip. Um, then again, look, these are grayed out because I don't have a second audio source. If I put one on here, um, these would light up, and then I could either check or uncheck them. What you see though is though if I do have a second audio source, I have them checked. I down mix it to stereo, and I mix multiple audio tracks, which means the in, the 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 sound coming in from say my microphone, and then say I was also grabbing. The desktop video here um, would be mixed into one track. What's good about that is then it does normalizing. It basically makes both soundtracks equal, so that one isn't over over or domineering over the other. Um, the other nice thing about that is that it makes the file size smaller. Um, sometimes I've seen video editors that actually didn't even pick up the second audio track. It only picked up the primary. So. For most general use uh, MSI Afterburner video capture uh, applications, I go ahead and just say go ahead and mix the audio tracks um, and let them and let them normalize out. That should be good enough for any anything you're going to ever put on, say, YouTube or Vimeo or whatever. Um, and again, if you want more functionality than this, chances are you're going to pay for it and you're not using Afterburner anyway. So, in any case. That's pretty much that's that's how everything works now. And you know the major tenets I'll tell you about after murder is, um, you know, learn where this setup is, and it's the video capture tab. Make sure your hardware can handle it. Make sure you've got your you should be recording to an external device, and make sure it's fast and that it's got a fast connection, no less than USB three. Um, and make sure that 
Um, you know, you take advantage. I mean, if you've got multiple threads that you can play with on your CPU, make sure you set this multi-threaded optimization as high as you can set it. Otherwise, just leave it alone. You know, for lower power systems like when I'm recording this on, I just leave it automatic and let it sort it out. Um, remember the gamma correction so that your videos are not dark. Um, and that, and uh, also remember but that there's a difference between when we're looking at uh, quality and, and frame size, the real difference here. Quality is just pretty much what it says, how good the video is, pretty much uh, almost a direct relation to what a bit rate would be as you're recording. Um, you know, 25% is more like 4K, 100% is more like 20K uh, as a bit rate. Frame size really is, it, that's almost a, a literal word because a quarter frame size will be a quarter of the size of your resolution. So if you're 1920 by 1080 and you do a quarter size, you know, you're going to end up with 640 by 480 or something like that. So, all right. So that's, that's the major things. That's how you use Afterburner. That's how you set it up. I certainly hope this was helpful, and I thank you for watching. Y'all have a great day. I'm out.